All right, hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Brian Siever, who is up in beautiful Santa Barbara today. How are you doing, Brian? Uh, it is a beautiful day in Santa Barbara. I'm doing great. Thank you, yeah. John. And it's a pretty nice day in San Diego. So we, um, we're we a little spoiled. We both get to live in really nice places. What can I say? Um, so uh, Brian is the CEO of Velvet Brick Selling Strategies, over 20 years industry experience building and leading sales, sales enabled and enablement and product operations for B2C and B2B organizations. And uh, you have worked a lot over the over the past number of years with startup uh, companies on helping them with their go to market strategies. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today, uh, Brian, is so how do you approach a go to market strategy with the startup? Because obviously, if you're working with the startup, they're very excited. They've got an idea. They've got a product. They've got a service. And the temptation is is just to go kind of scattergun approach to the whole world. So how do you help them to formulate a focus go to market strategy? Yeah, great question. Um, one of the one of the things that that we've been able to do over the past several years with startups is to really uh, suggest that they focus on their go to market selling strategy in four areas. One is the the tech stack. What is the technology that's going to be required first to, to drive the engine uh, in a small type, uh, you know, just born type organization mm -hmm. with maybe a lot of money, but again, shotgun approach isn't going to isn't going to work. So tech stack, what's that going to be like and what are the actual needs of the sales organization? That tech stack decision for a startup needs to also take into mind, are we going to go channel, direct or both? because the technology stack that is selected needs to be able to scale for those two longer term visions. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Number two, for a product and service, most companies will get tricked into thinking that sales enablement, which has been around forever, it's just a, a good name now that I think people have jumped onto, is much more than training. Part of go to market for a startup is how are we gonna get the team internally prepared for the release. So mm -hmm. there has to be a release strategy. And that's where marketing and sales have got to be able to, at least in our experience, be linked at the absolute hip. Um, easier said than done, yeah. that's point number two. Uh, number three are the actual skill sets of the organization. So early on, what we like to do is go in and kind of do a health check, if you mm -hmm. will, a diagnostic leadership competencies. What are the core competencies? Is this going to be an inbound play exclusively, inbound or outbound? Uh, and, and what are the learning paths that the organization has to go down? And, and if I might, just one yeah. comment about this, uh, this idea of training and market preparedness around your sales force. Uh, millennials, as we all know, seem to challenge most organizations. Mm -hmm. um, our, our position is, is that maybe it's a, as much of a leadership morph that needs to happen as well as this new generation coming in. However, the startups that we're working with we're really working hard to encourage getting a first, second, and third year certification program in place. Mm, that's a good idea. Because millennials are asking those questions. What are you going to do for me? How will my career benefit by joining your organization? Mm -hmm. With a 3.9, 3.7% labor uh, or, or uh, uh, unemployment rate, Yeah. If if a startup does not know what their 90 day ramp criteria is going to be for onboarding. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know how they're going to get their teams ready for product and service releases with marketing, then you've got whack-a-mole syndrome all <laughs> over the place as a startup. And there's already resource constraints. Right. So that's number three. And then finally, number four is industry knowledge. Mm -hmm. What is the industry doing and, and how are we going to help keep in front of those changes as the company begins to scale? So there's a couple of interesting points in there. So when you come in and you work with the organization, particularly around, you know, skill set, uh, one of the things that you will often find, as is, is you will know better than me even, uh, is with startups is that, you know, the people involved in the startup may 
think that they want may think that they're good at one thing and want to focus on that area but that's not their strength their strengths may be somewhere else so how do you help like very enthusiastic very invested startup folks who want to focus on jobs maybe that they're not suited to and don't want to focus where their actual skill sets lie yeah it, it it's a great question and after about 25 people you get to specialization and i don't want to be specialized anymore because i loved working 20 hours a day doing everything yeah um it, one one of the factors that we find is that the org structure from a two year horizon hasn't been well thought out. Mm -hmm. So there's not a mental model for what is this going to look like 18 months from now, assuming success. Th that visual plus what is in the best interest of the customer, we find so often there's excitement about getting the product to the customer. But there's a loss of focus very, very early on on what's in the best interest of mm -hmm. the customer. So <clears throat> what we really uh, see the most successful organizations doing is in those early in, in those early months, having a dialogue with the core leadership team. We know we're going to have to specialize. This is inevitable. What does that structure look like even before we need to act on it? So they're well poised, prepared, and they've already thought through this is how our organization is going to need to perform. That's wholly different than and your experiences may be similar. You get into the firefight and then uh, organizations are forced to make decisions on separation of skill and ability with role and responsibility under duress mm -hmm. rather than proactively. And that's just a huge bummer for everybody because it mm. rarely works. Yeah, but but it's in some ways, though, especially in the early excitement days, it's like crisis management becomes. Yeah. I worked at an organization one time, I'll be honest with you, where um, the leadership were the were fantastic at crisis management. Boy, when when things started to go wrong, they came together and they were absolutely brilliant. But the minute the crisis was over, they all went back to the way. So it was literally like, uh, well, we'll see you next crisis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. I was in Atlanta last week working with a group of sales professionals, and uh, we talked about an organization's addiction to urgency, mm -hmm. and it's very real. Uh, there is, especially in sales organizations, the rush to close deals, management can sometimes get so focused on the numbers early on, obviously as a startup, uh, and that dopamine rush of hearing that bell go off mm -hmm. uh, can, can create self-induced urgency that a lot of our work early on is to try and uh, ask some pointed questions about is this self-imposed battle wound? Is this market imposed? And let's not repeat some behaviors that are leading to uh, unnecessary conclusions of waste, uh, ban more bandwidth constraints, and ultimately a loss of money, which mm -hmm. the VCs are not really happy about. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and you mentioned another um, interesting point here is so when they bring the the product or service to market, right? There's the initial excitement, and obviously there's a huge amount of in, investment, both not just financially, but you know, resources, time, emotion, all of that kind of stuff. And yet, the reaction from the customer, you're going to get some reactions that you weren't expecting because customers are always going to find a way of using your product or service in a way that you could never have you know tested for or or legislated for and yeah. that can be and that can be difficult right uh when maybe an issue comes up or maybe they're using a different way maybe it's challenging and there is a natural inclination for the 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 company to get a little defensive as opposed to embrace this right yeah yeah that's right that's right and you know simon sinek um ha has has just such great stuff out there and one of his uh, more famous is you know leaders don't know what the game they're in uh would recommend all of your viewers uh watch that video mm -hmm. he talks about the law of diffusion of innovation and we use that all of the time it's been around for quite a while to try and isolate and profile for a startup, are you going after the early adopters mm -hmm. or are you going after that early majority with your product and service releases? Because if the marketing organization has creating content and is going after a broad brush approach to create market interest, 
yet this first product is is an early product to market it's novel it's a new innovation that may actually be counterintuitive for what needs to happen to be able to get the momentum so when i say sales and marketing need to be synced at the hip profiling the early adopters that magic 18 mm-hmm. percent and knowing who we're actually going to sell this to, what are their behaviors? What are they saying on social chatter? How can we aggregate the data between Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, all of the other social mediums to then determine, are we taking those marketing dollars Mm -hmm. and pointing them to a population that are then going to sing our praises early, early on? What we find, John, is most organizations, when they're about ready to do a product release, marketing is marketing with a message that is very generic, Mm -hmm. going after the masses. Right. The technologists in the company need the early adopters to validate that this is working functional and adding value to get the testimonials and the case studies to build the, the social machine and the sales organization is being handed marketing content that's generic instead of speaking the language of the early adopters. Mm -hmm. So this go-to-market strategy is one that in the heat of the moment, we're ready, let's go, but to whom, way more than a persona, right? It's Mm -hmm. what are their interests, what are they talking about right now as it relates to the challenges they're having less your product so we can get on the advertising machine and get your salespeople poised to have a conversation with someone that has a different language set around innovation than that middle majority. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a hugely, hugely important issue. No, absolutely. And then the other one that you, you, know, you touched upon is just the, as we said, the organizational structure and all of that is one of the things that you see a lot, you know, especially with startups and especially when they maybe get some investment dollars, right, from a VC, they immediately go on a hiring splurge, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like they come up with, Every possible, oh, we need somebody for that, hire for that. We need somebody for this, hire for this. And before you know it, you've hired all these people. Then you've got to put in a middle management tier and all of that. And yeah, and the reality is you're, 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 you're burning through cash. Then you say, well, we need a building. Well, we need a big office space. Instead of really focusing on on what you really, what roles do you really need and what do you need people to do and what can you outsource? What can you do differently? Instead of just right. suddenly you've gone from an, from a, a maybe an agile organization to a not so agile organization because you put in all these layers of bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Throwing bodies at problems mm-hmm. has been a very, very typical organizational response for a long time. And, and the holistic view of tech stack, go-to-market skills and Mm -hmm. abilities and industry, we have found over the years helps to try and identify and isolate, ironically, some of these plausible scenarios that can cause an enormous amount Mm -hmm. of downside uh, ripple effects in the negative way. So instead of just hiring bodies, what do we do to put some decision gates in to help with the the one leader that maybe sees bodies as the answer mm-hmm. and the other e- leader who's the co-owner of the company that sees innovation as the answer. Mm-hmm. What do we do to objectify a decision model that says, OK, when we see these these road signs, this is when we look at people resources. When this rears its head, this is when we go after a technology solution early on. Mm-hmm. So the discipline around that's critical. And, and what we've found is, you know, some tools and some processes, um, although not overly bureaucratic, does invoke some discipline for the for the startups. So they spend their money wisely and don't just hire 20 people thinking that that's how we're going to go sell a lot more stuff. It just mm-hmm. doesn't need to be that way yeah no exactly and especially because there are so many uh solutions today where you've got technology you've got outsource platforms you've got lots of different ways of being able to scale an organization without necessarily scaling it uh, through people and buildings and all of that kind of all of that kind of good stuff but that's where i always find that it's funny because you see a lot of organ you see a lot of um highly innovated 
highly innovative companies, right? You know, especially up in Silicon Valley, highly innovative in what they're doing with their with their you know product or service. And then they just go down, then they just fall into, suddenly they become very traditional. Oh, no, they've got to buy, a, get a building in San Francisco. They've got to hire people locally. Their costs go through the roof. They become very traditional in the way they approach their business, yet they yeah. have an innovative product. And it's it's a weird dichotomy, right? It, it is. And, and that's where we cross the chasm between sales readiness mm -hmm. and what what is the cultural uh, outcome that the leaders want, right? Mm -hmm. So organizational culture and the values that that leadership team chooses to select or not select. And so the culture becomes a, a, a culture that has happened to the leaders. Mm -hmm. If you and I start a company together, John, and we're both equally as passionate and we see the world exactly the same, that's fantastic. <laughs> But if our answer to social questions, to motivation questions, to EQ questions inside the organization are polar opposites, then people aren't really going to know what is going to be our response when we need this at a mm -hmm. core value standpoint. Before we do anything with any company, we'll go through and walk the halls, even if it's five people and ask the litmus test question, what are the core values of this organization? Mm -hmm. And if that question is cannot be answered or five people give us five different answers, we don't even start go to market selling strategies until we get the leaders in the room and say, okay, what do you hold dear that is going to carry this organization through the next 10 to 15 years? What do you really believe? Because if they believe in innovation, Yet the response after the product release is, let's go to bureaucracy and layers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's in direct conflict with the values of innovation. Mm -hmm. And somebody needs to be checked in terms of, wait a minute, this is not the path that we agreed to. What are we doing? And that's the discipline around being not only Mach 9 at getting a product and service out there, but also staying above the fray to make sure that the behavioral attributes and social attributes of the machine that you're building are coalescing to get you to that desired outcome. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more because like I said, it is it is a strange one where you have disruptive products, disruptive business models, and then suddenly organizationally, you become about as traditional as you could possibly yeah. get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's no innovation on the organization side. It's all on the product side. Right. Or in, in the face of the team, it's all about innovation. And then behind the closed door, the leadership conversation is much different. Mm -hmm. Right. It's highly bureaucratic, very uh, old school and is an anchor to the organization. So then you've got you've got a dichotomy. The organization is hearing great stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's being invoked has been if it if it's a boomer or late gen x type of leadership team there may be mental models at play that are grounding it into older school thinking mm -hmm. so it's a, it's thank you for bringing that up because yeah. it crosses it crosses over to to organizational development and org psych as well and one last thing i just wanted to touch on because you know you mentioned a lot about millennials here and one of the things i think that is 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 challenging for for people nowadays is that we've seen a lot of research about you know millennials you know stay in jobs maybe two years or whatever before they move on or whatever and that's okay uh, but i think you have to you have to legislate for that when you you have to become an organization that's good at recruiting that's good at onboarding people quickly and as you say training them maybe making it attractive for them to stay but also recognizing that you are going to have turnover and it may have and it may often have zero to do with your organization it's just to do with you know the mindset of the of the people that you're hiring so being able to be more more flexible in how you resource uh, you know is obviously a big challenge it it certainly is it is the number one challenge uh when when we're on the road and and we're talking to mid-sized companies mm -hmm. that have evolved and you know maybe got to 50 million 100 million dollars uh the conversation is much different in terms of you know oh my god how are we going to go find top talent and if the if the house isn't in order if those things that we've talked about 
that the top startups do to get the the foundationals the foundational layers in place around culture values behaviors strategy then when you're a mid-sized company and you need to you realize okay people are staying shorter four years maybe if we're lucky mm-hmm. two years for the younger ones as they look and bounce around to sure. find that sweet spot type job um you know how are we going to build our bench in this situation our you know our belief is you can get a millennial to stay for 10 years as long as the leadership team knows what are the leadership characteristics and behaviors to build a culture where people want to stay mm-hmm. the irony is is that the data on why people leave their organizations hasn't changed in 30 years the direct relationship that i have with my boss mm-hmm. right i either love them or they don't love me and it's time for me to get out because it's dysfunctional however we're seeing millennials bounce more because of this built up uh, issue in the industry about the millennial problem, which is more a leadership problem uh, from our vantage point than it is the millennials. They want empathy. They want to be trained. They want to know that their career has a shot longer than maybe their first 90 days. And they want to know that they're building something that's bigger than them. Mm -hmm. That is what startups have been doing all the days long. It's just that the leaders don't know that how to lead the millennials is different than how a boomer was motivated or Gen X. But what we're seeing more and more is the leaders are sitting in a room saying, well, God, these, you know, these millennials are so entitled. They're so lazy. They're not. They're brilliant. They want to contribute and they want to stay. They just are looking for things that human beings look for in organizations And our organizations have turned into too much bureaucracy for them. Ironically, it's what we bitch about all the time too, right? So it's 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 quite fascinating. Yeah, and that's why I think flexible working models are are fantastic. And I think that we live in a world today where I think the the uh, the model of putting a building in a big metropolis and forcing people to live in expensive areas that they can't afford to and spending ridiculous hours commuting at all is is the absolute wrong way to go about it. We we live in a world today where we should be accommodating a greater flexibility with uh, you know where and how people work so that they're they can choose choose where you choose where you want to live and like raise your family or do whatever it is you do. And and facilitate you being able to to work from there it makes much more sense to me. Absolutely, and from an employer standpoint, all of those cost reductions and Absolutely. having and and having people nested closer to customers yeah. is outstanding. It's the how do I get over the hump if I've been raised in an mm-hmm. old school mindset that when they're under roof, mm-hmm. the asylum has some semblance of order. Well, if that's yeah. the world view. It's going to be a really rough road, right? <laughs> For but sure. If I'm, if I'm open to the idea of leading a virtual team and changing what I need to do to be effective mm-hmm. at that, man, all of a sudden it opens up my talent pool oh. exponentially. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't. And by the way, it becomes transnational too. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. All right. Well, listen, we've, uh, we've actually, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I've gone a little longer than usual, Brian. So uh, uh, before we go, I want to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can learn more about you. Oh, sure. Um, I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, uh, my contact information is the following. If you'd like me to give that out. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, it's just Brian Siever, B-R-Y-A-N-S-I-E-V-E-R at gmail.com. We've been very fortunate in our company. Um, in 20 years, we've we've uh, just received our business through referrals. So I don't have a website. Sorry, um, haven't needed one. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about what we do, uh, please feel free to reach out, send us an email, be happy to talk through and provide any research that we have that's publicly available. And uh, we love what we do. Um, I am on the road three weeks out of every month working with startups and mid-sized companies trying to help them do as best as they can and uh, and make money, uh, not for money's sake, but to help their employees have lives uh, and uh, experiences that they deserve. So I Excellent. appreciate the opportunity very much, John. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Brian. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.